we had this very interesting conversation about uh, what kind of civilization. I just want to return all of you to your, the cradle of humanity where all of us come from, Africa. Africa is not just the cradle of humanity in terms of the physical human evolution, but also in terms of it being the first place where human civilization emerged. And I think there are some lessons from how the human race evolved in a space which was untouched by, obviously, other beings other than the natural environment of which you were a part. And I think there is much wisdom to be learned from how was it possible that we evolved amongst the lions, amongst the, all of the predators that were around us because there were no cats. And I think this realization is beginning to dawn on biologists. And I want to remind you of a beautiful saying in a book by Andreas Weber, who asked us to take seriously in his book, The Biology of Wonder, as a scientific fact, the idea that the natural world is not comprised of biological machines. It's a sensuous, pulsating reality. And his words, which I think I can't improve on are, in the ecological commons, a multitude of different individuals and diverse species stand in various relations with one another. Competition, cooperation, partnership, predation, productivity, and destruction. All these relations, however, follow one higher law, which is over the long run, only behavior that allows for productivity of the whole ecosystem and that does not interrupt itself, production is amplified. The individual can only realize itself if the whole can realize itself. Ecological freedom obeys this form of necessity. The deeper the, deeper the connections in the system, the more creative niches it will afford for its individual members. And in my continent, we call this Ubuntu. The I see you in me and you see me in, in you. And this relational construct, this philosophical orientation that ties us together inextricably, that I can't call myself human unless I recognize your humanity. This is profound. And this approach, if we were to return to it, not as a slogan, but as a lived reality, I think we'll be able to answer the question, by what values should we be governing the economic commons. The sad reality is because we departed from this, that the commons, which is the wildlife, the beautiful landscapes of the African continent has been decimated. I think it was Herbie who said that Julius Caesar looked at North Africa and so a food basket, and therefore created decimation which led to the Saharan desert, and of course, desertification continues. The question we have to answer as we deal with this reality and the tool that has been afforded by the SDGs is how are we going to heal the wounds that were inflicted on this cradle of humanity, which is 
an ecosystem today that probably has the most unique species of wildlife, trees, and has the potential to be the lung for this planet that is suffocating from the pollution. And I want to, in considering this issue of how do we heal this cradle of humanity, I want to read you a poem from a book that was given to me this morning by Daishaku Keita, Akeda. I can't pronounce it probably properly, but here is the, the poem. A mountain represents its people. Nature represents its people. Landscapes are mirrors presenting people's hearts, just as gardens offer images of their homeowners' hearts. Landscapes reflect the hearts of their citizens. I bring to you bleeding hearts from my continent. Someone was telling me at lunchtime that there are plans to drill into wetlands in, in the Af uh, one of the African countries in return for rents of $600 million a year. There is no price you can attach to those wetlands. But that's going to happen unless we, the people, we, the global community, recognize that for as long as Africa's natural resources have no value, they are not calculated in the GDP of the world. And our politicians take the first 600 million and sell a totally irreplaceable ecosystem to the highest bidder. And you and I are responsible as stewards of that heritage that we owe not just to our children's children, but to the future generations that deserve better. And I believe we have the capacity if our mindset shifts from what can we do for them to saying what can we do for us. Thank you. <laughs>